Herzlich willkommen, GPN Gulasch Programmiernacht 21, Tag 2. Schönen Nachmittag. Draußen ist es warm, deswegen ist der Saal voll, das ist schön. Ähm, ihr habt es schon mitbekommen, so diese ganzen LM, LLMs und so weiter wollen uns ja eigentlich wahrmachen oder glauben lassen, dass die ähm, IT und IT-Security ja eigentlich total langweilig ist und unkreativ ist und dass man das ja einfach durch irgendwelche Bots ersetzen kann. Ähm, was dem nicht so ist und ganz im Gegenteil, dass man ganz viel Kreativität braucht, erzählt uns jetzt dann gleich die Jiska mit Beyond the Checkbox Breaking Out Testing Frameworks. Bitte begrüßt Sie mit einem großen Applaus. So, thank you for the introduction. I think I screwed up the language setting in, in uh, the submission. Uh, it's my fuck up, sorry. Uh, no, because it, it was German until yesterday and then I switched it to English because someone told me, isn't it talking English? It has like an, an English abstract and everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's gonna be in English. I hope everyone here is fine with that. Um, yeah, so I'm Jeska, I work in academia, so, or like I'm sort of a hackademic, so I hack all the things uh, for science. And uh, there, I'm usually not using testing frameworks, but of course, many people do. Like, who of you is like regularly doing pen tests or something? Yeah, a few, or playing CTF. Yeah, a few. Okay. <laughs> so some of the target audience are here. <laughs> All right. Um, originally, I gave this talk uh, at uh, an OBAS meetup. And uh, so it is a bit tailored to the OVAS mobile application security verification standard. But believe me, like, it applies to basically any testing framework that you find out there. So the takeaways are similar no matter which testing framework you take. The idea of a testing framework is that you have like, complete and consistent test results. So when you have any product out, out there and you test it with this specification or standard, then you would get like all, all the things that are insecure yeah, and can fix them. And uh, the test results are always comparable. So that's the, the theory. And the good part about this is uh, compliance, right? So you have a security checklist for those complete consistent results. You can check your application. And you can say, yes, we are compliant. All checkboxes filled. Um, yeah, but yeah, reality is a bit different. Reality is more like, yeah, you know, we had this crazy idea, and then this happens, and the other thing happens, and uh, uh, <laughs> that's that's real world a bit of. So real world attackers might be, yeah, you know, I let them connect to my free Starbucks Wi-Fi, and then I use whatever, or I just use my zero day exploit, and I will hack you. Uh, that, that's reality, and so sophisticated attacks happen, and it means also, and I think that's not in the attacker model for most people, but basically if someone can afford buying a zero day to hack you, you are screwed no matter how much of testing you did. So for a long time I was like, yeah, we don't need those testing guides at all, like, why are they there? It's just checkboxes, it's all boring, you can always hack into a system with sufficient effort. And especially in, in academia, where I come from, I think they are not so relevant, even though academia should actually contribute to them more. But uh, they are not so relevant most of the time, because what you do in academia, you want to create something novel. That means you pick an interesting target that nobody looked into before. You find a new bug class that nobody cared about before, or you research something new, like a new bug finding method. You write a new fuzzer or something. And this is often a very difficult journey, uh, but all of these things, they create novelty, so that's the, the central point. But because they are novel, you don't know when researching if you will actually find a new bug or if you will be successful. So it's really, really uncertain what happens. So you would have a target that nobody looked into. You will start like somewhere and you might make wrong decisions and just will not find any bug ever. And sometimes just slight yeah, minor differences might make you find something in the real world. And 
I think the most yeah, not, not so fun part about this is you might spend like half a year on a target looking into it. And meanwhile, someone on, on Twitter is just posting like, yeah, here's a treatable proof of concept, how you break the target. And, and, and you're like, what? Yeah, really? <laughs> but this, this happens. Um, and in this whole process, usually those, those checklist guides, they won't lead you to novel research. So that's to be said about them. And basically, all the things that I did with Bluetooth, so like the introduction, yeah, were probably not on a, on a checklist. So the first thing was I was yeah, looking uh, into how to hook into Bluetooth communication in a way that you could even look into cryptographic implementation details. Nobody ever tested that before. And it turned out, yeah, once you are able to test the Bluetooth protocol with cheap devices, there are bugs that are in billions of devices, but yeah, no tooling. <laughs> or the attack surfaces for wireless, where like you only attack Bluetooth, but uh, Wi-Fi is a different thing. But actually, you can, like in, in a combo chip from Bluetooth to Wi-Fi, get code execution. That's just not in the generic attacker model. So there are things that are outside of those attack surfaces, which are, of course, not covered by any checkbox list. And the next thing is, yes, there are fuzzers out there, but they were incapable of fuzzing Bluetooth stacks. So you just yeah, take any Bluetooth implementation, try to put a fuzzer around it, do some new things to, to make it run better, and suddenly you find bugs. So basically, where, where I started, there were none of these testing guides just unanswered questions. So I was like, yeah, could this work? Could that work? I was also trying things that were unsuccessful, not on this list. Uh, and, and they were all, yeah, outside of this. But what happened then is that uh, a lot of students at the university uh, were like, hey, for my thesis, I don't want to do something that's so uncertain. Like this, this research is really, really uncertain, and it often takes longer than, than half a year of the thesis. So they were saying, like, hey, when, when I graduate, I want to become a pen tester, or like I have experience with CTFs, I want to do something of a, a similar scope for my thesis. And they also said, yeah, Bluetooth, I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing. I want to do like web, mobile applications, IoT, like something that I know. Um, so how do we test this? And, and suddenly, I was back at those testing guides that are out there. So yeah, some researchers might not need those testing guides, but <laughs> actually, uh, for, for some scenarios, they are pretty good. And uh, one of the students I supervised even contributed a bit to, to such a testing guide. Um, but yeah, a bit more on, on this later. So. Uh, app testing guides you can think of, uh, they, they have a very generic threat model. So let's say for mobile applications, you would think of yeah, what could go wrong in any mobile application. And it doesn't matter if this application is like an online banking app, or if it is a fitness tracker app, or just a game. It, it would just be the same threat model for any mobile application. And from this threat model, you then derive like a list of common attacks that could affect such a mobile application. And then people look like, what are tools and tests out there that we could use to find those vulnerabilities? Sometimes there are tools. Sometimes you have to do like a little bit on your own. And that's how, how any framework actually works. So no matter if it's a mobile app or like a general IoT testing framework or something, like you have those generic model of how something works, and try to derive attacks and, and tests. The cool thing about it is like, um, you would get common issues that should be tested for every app. So if those lists generate findings, and those findings are severe, like not all of the findings are severe, but if those lists generate severe findings, then you really did something wrong. Like you shouldn't have such bugs in your app. And it's also beginner friendly. Like if you don't know where to start, like especially uh, as, as a student for your thesis or something, um, it's, it's really nice to have this list telling you, yeah, these are common threads to test for. 
And also already knowing a list of tools can be very helpful when you start with something. But then there is uh, also a lot of contra about this. So your results will never be complete. So I don't think that any testing framework ensures completeness. That's like an overclaim. There's always something that was not covered. And even if you have a very narrow like scope, if you say it's only mobile applications, there's so much different tooling to create mobile applications and so many different like frameworks, programming languages and everything. So even if you would only test for one type of vulnerability in all those apps, you would need very different tooling and your results might still yeah, be inconsistent. So just the, the way how you create them leads to inconsistency. So I don't think that with any guide you could say we have completeness and we have consistency no matter how hard you try. And also those bug classes, they might change over time. So yes, the testing guides, frameworks, they might be updated, but not necessarily. So it could just change and not cover it. So probably it's much more important to teach students how do, do you do like research uh, and find bugs for a lifetime, not just checking checklists. So how do you do thread modeling on your own instead of taking one that exists? How do you create your own tooling? So there is really a lot of app testing guide blind spots. And I think the, the first big one is that, yeah, you have to do your own thread model. You have to create your own lists of what are threats, attacks, what do I want to protect, and what do I need to prioritize? This is the next issue. Like, I think for a lot of testing frameworks, you would generate many, many minor findings that are not necessarily relevant to the app, uh, but at least you would get a long list, and that makes the customer happy, so to say, because there's many things that they can, yeah, just minor fixes. And also, and especially in academia, there is no out of scope. Also for real world attackers, there is no out of scope. But very often for pen testing, there is a very narrow scope. And of course, you need to build your own tooling. There's also often not the time to build your own tooling in pen testing. So what I just discovered was when, when you don't have tooling, you create tools for something that's a bit product applicable, then suddenly you, you would find a lot of bugs. And for the OWASP application uh, standard, the uh, security verification standard, well, they have just common threads. And the testing guide just says, yeah, there is the following tooling, use this. So you probably won't find many new things. So if two pen testers would like use the, the same list and just exactly follow it, yeah, it's <laughs> not much new to find, but there might still be a lot of oversights. And there is like one thing that this guide in particular does, like it assumes that a mobile app is pretty much a web client. I think that's also an OWASP thing, like everything is basically web in the end. Um, and that's actually not so good, especially if you look into uh, the storage requirements. So one idea in this guide is that when you have anything stored locally on a device, that's insecure, like other apps might attack the sandbox of the app, or your backup might be somewhere in iCloud, or even on your local Mac, or whatever, like Google Cloud, something where like your backup lands in the end. And that could be insecure. So to control the data and secure it, it's much better to put the data in the cloud. That's the theory, but the cloud of the uh, the vendor in this case. So, for example, if you have a fitness tracker, then the fitness data should go into the cloud of the fitness tracker provider. <laughs> or, I don't know, yeah, I, I don't know, it's what, what they say, yeah, or your personal pictures, private messages, everything is more secure when you move it to the cloud. And maybe think a bit about this, like, uh, what, what is good, what is not so good. Um, and, like, also for usability, I think it's pretty horrible. Uh, I don't know who of you has tried uh, backing up their signal messages. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really horrible. <laughs> yeah, but backing up your signal messages like 
every time you migrate to a new device, like there's a high chance that you lose them. But of course, they are very, very secure, stored on your one mobile phone and really hard to migrate. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons, like following such standards rather than thinking like, yeah, giving the user a possibility to, to say where the data goes and actually backing it up when they want it. And of course, another thing that I personally, personally hate a lot <laughs> about such standards is that they say, hey, we should prevent researchers from reverse engineering and tampering with our applications. Um, there are, of course, some cases where it might be legit. Let's say an online banking app maybe should not run on a rooted or jailbroken device because yeah, it has to do with your money and sandboxes might be broken. But in most cases, those detections are really harmful for security researchers because well, when, even when there is a bug bounty, if you need to spend many hours or even days to bypass such detections before you can even analyze an application, nobody will look into this. Uh, and then even if you have a bug bounty program, you won't get any yeah, free research or free security testing. So don't think about this being the only security measure as well, because yes, it takes time to bypass, but all of these solutions are very, very similar. So a powerful attacker who is doing bypasses for reverse engineering frequently it just takes the same script and it will run. Uh, on, on basically all the apps, like there's not so many different solutions out there. I even heard of stories where um, like pen testers were, okay, we are testing the app, okay, the app has a jailbreak detection, so we cannot analyze it, so it's basically secure, like all the other tests kind of passed. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so really think about building this into applications. Uh, it, it's not necessarily a security measure. Also something that I heard might come to one of the future uh, standards, but it's not yet in there, is user privacy. I think the biggest risk of mobile apps is really privacy these days. There is almost no mobile app that is not using any advertisement framework. They're sending all your data uh, it's, it's really crazy what is sent if you sniff the traffic from, from an application. There's many, many information about you, and yes, it's kind of pseudonymized or something like but it's not really fully anonymous. There's so many details about you to track you and to get all the data about you. And often it's, I mean, apps are free, so you want free applications, and you can ask applications not to track but in the end, uh, the data about you is, is still being sent to servers. Like there's only a few exceptions where application wouldn't try to track as many information as you as they can, just for advertisement reasons. And now the next thing is like, as I said, real world attackers. Yeah, you have your app. That's the thing that you pen test, but it runs. Uh, on a mobile platform, for example, yeah, so here on the right hand side, you can see roughly the structure of like how modern Android looks these days. So you have your app, but there's system apps that are pre-installed. Then there is some Java framework stuff, native libraries, uh, an Android runtime, some hardware abstraction kernel firmware stuff. So a lot of things that an application depends on and where you say, well, it's out of scope, right? <laughs> so usually that would be, um, of course, out of scope for a normal pen test. But for me, as a security researcher in, in the university context, I say, like, actually, this is much more interesting than the app itself. So if something there breaks, uh, that's really of, of impact for everything. So interesting here is, for example, all the frameworks, if they are part of iOS or Android, or even third-party frameworks that are used in a lot of applications are interesting. Um, yeah, so the, the, the interesting part here is also sometimes when you do like very good testing of applications, you might end up finding bugs in the operating system. So. Uh, one example is a VPN application that, that one of my students was testing, and they were just um, 
trying to yeah, use a, a standard VPN application, creating VPN profiles all through a standard app, and suddenly something in the network stack crashed so that you wouldn't get network connection until you reboot and remove the VPN profile. Um, and of course, this was through the app, but affected the operating system in the end. And this can happen pretty quickly. And now, of course, really out of scope for most people, but there is, of course, also firmware attacks. Um, so anything that's running in a chip on your device, which is getting more and more, is basically unprotected. Um, the reason for this is, so you have more and more coprocessors uh, on, on your phones these days for performance reasons, um, but they don't have a lot of security measures. So you have security from the 90s in, in those firmware chips, and hope that like some kernel layer in between protects you, but it's often not the case. Like um, as we have also seen with the latest publications from Google Project Zero, there's uh, this display coprocessor in iPhones that has been attacked, and they even found uh, a lot of baseband flaws and so on. So firmware is really not secure, and uh, for Bluetooth, I've also been looking at firmware, and there's like. If you're lucky, there are stack canaries, but it, maybe even not this. There is no ASLR. Uh, it's, it's really, really broken. And I mean, firmware, yeah, some people at least look into this and become aware of this. I think Android, they started rewriting some firmware in Rust, so maybe it's moving forward. Um, but then stuff really nobody looks into are those, those lowest layers, the hardware. Um, and there is so many issues there, like uh, there could be side channels and you could monitor anything like, or let's say there is a cryptographic calculation and there might be a side channel to get the key from this. Or fault injection is a way to actually skip instructions or manipulate memory reads in, in the CPU so that it would do something different than what was written in the code. And with this you can at least theoretically, <laughs> bypass a lot of things. I mean, those attacks are expensive, um, but at least they are also like super, super powerful. And if I say expensive, this is one thing, like many people say, I don't care about hardware attacks, it's out of scope. But when designing something, just think about that it is expensive to do this attack on one device. So if someone really breaks whatever is stored on a device and gets all the information from it, knows everything from cryptographic keys about one device, this shouldn't break any other devices. So this is a, a key design element uh, to keep in mind here. So yeah, those testing guides, they are really, really helpful for identifying common issues, um, but really also think about what you found, are those security threats relevant? Are they significant? Is it something that you should report to developers or is it just confusing? Like those checklists often really generate minor findings that are not worth being fixed depending on the actual threat model. Um, so will it improve security when it will be fixed or is it just really, really annoying to fix? And this also creates a lot of tension between developers and security testers. I think in academia, we have those really weird attack surfaces that are new and hard to explain, and people have to fix them. For pen testers, it's more like all those non-minor findings that someone has to fix. Um, so really communicating what is important to fix is important here. And that's it already with my talk. Uh, Feel free if you have any questions. Perfectly on time. Thank you very much. Questions, please raise your hand. I'll come with the mic to you. Come, there have to be some. Come on. Don't be shy. I won't bite, promise. You can also anonymously tell uh, what was your worst pen test rep uh, report that you got. <laughs> or a friend of yours got. <laughs> a friend of yours got, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there in, in the back is someone. Oh, yeah, coming. <laughs> Breaking the ice, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, since it's also about weird things in pen tests, I just say SQL injection in username field. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, this should be tested. Um, that's what I said. Like, if someone finds issues with, with those very basic uh, things, like something is really broken in your app, um, <laughs> yeah. How, how creative do your, do your students get with uh, defining new new bugs or new approaches to, to finding bugs. Do they surprise you? Yes, yes. So there's really, like, every now and then I would get students who think further than me and who I learned from. Um, and that's something I really enjoy about my work as well. So uh, see people grow, see people coming up with ideas, discussing, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, out of scope, so what are you doing if you found something critical and the vendor just said, yeah, sorry, but this is out of scope, we don't want to handle this? I mean, what, what do you mean? Like, I mean, there is kind of two things, yeah? Either the vendor said it's out of scope, it's not about bug bounty, it's just about reporting. So I don't care if it would get money, if they say it's out of scope and we don't fix it, then apparently one can publish, right? I mean, if it doesn't have to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. So do you do this regularly? Like, uh, uh, publish it for uh, publishing something that Windows doesn't want to get fixed? It's difficult. So I think uh, one thing we, we looked into recently that is difficult to fix uh, is digital car keys. So they have an algorithm to measure the distance in ultra-wideband. Um, and there is something broken in the spec that would allow some distance uh, shortening, depending on how the algorithm is implemented and what checks are there. And it's not fully specified how chips do it. And we found it works on, on Apple's chips, as long as one of the answers is Apple's chips. Um, and so, yes, I mean, the question is, would you publish or would you not publish? But in this case, I think it helped a lot publishing it and letting people know that what the spec says is not necessarily secure um, early on. It, it's really difficult. Yeah? Sometimes you say maybe one shouldn't publish it, um, but most of the time publishing such a thing, even if it's a bit difficult to fix or a bit out of scope, um, helps to not have it built into a lot of systems and relying too much on it. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. That was really cool. Then, regarding side channels, would you say today we are in so many layers of abstraction that we can't even make sure anymore a normal Android app looks out for side channels? Sorry? What? Would you say we are on too many layers of abstraction today that a normal Android app can't look out anymore for side channel attacks or the like? I think there have been even side channel attacks shown to work in browsers. So, um... I, I think it would just, like even with the abstraction layers, some stuff should be working. Um, it, it really depends. So, um, also depends on what kind of side channel, like CPU side channel, or maybe like for me as a wireless person, maybe you would have a side channel from traffic patterns or something, uh, like knowing if other apps are sending something. Like there's so many things that you could consider a side channel and also a lot of things happening in the background that you might be able to trigger and measure. Um, I think there have been also papers for, for mobile side channels, but not so many people looked into it. That's, that's true. Any further questions? Last chance? Going once? Yep, coming. <laughs> Um, so if, you, if I understood correctly, um, it's not really useful to use these standardized tests in um, academia, but do you think it's still worthwhile to use them in commercial pen testing? 
I think so, yes. I mean, what I would do in commercial pen testing is nonetheless try to make some thread model and, and compare. So it's, I would say they are good to start with, but not good to end with. So just thinking a bit further uh, really helps. Anyone else? Last chance? Well, if there are no further questions, I would say thank you very much, Iska, for the wonderful talk, and please give a very, round, a very warm round of applause for Iska. Thank you. Thank you.